Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. We're starting 10 minutes late, as you uh, probably are aware of. Uh, this, uh, my name is Christopher Monroe from the University of Maryland, and I'll be chairing uh, the next two speakers who will speak on the topic of quantum simulation. So our first speaker is Randy Hewlett from Rice University, and he'll tell us about quantum magnetism in cold Fermi gases. Randy. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here in Korea, and uh, I want to thank the organizers of the meeting, and especially the local organizers who volunteered to uh, put this thing together and make it happen. It's, uh, it's a lot of work to do this kind of thing. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, two experiments that we've done at Rice in collaboration with the group of theorists, which is uh, indicated here in red. Um, they were very important for um, interpreting the data and directing how the experiments went, so I want to acknowledge them uh, up front. And also the experimenter, experimentalist and the people at Rice that are helping us, also Caden Hazard, who's a theorist, Hapiel Tellis, uh, are uh, all at Rice University. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, many body physics with ultra cold atoms. Now, this is a field that uh, this audience is now well aware of, and uh, it's, uh, there's a long list of, of topics on the right where uh, people are either working on or um, talking about or, or doing the theory for uh, solving systems of strongly correlated Fermi gases that are relevant to condensed matter physics or to nuclear and particle physics, for example, that involve uh, dense and cold fermions. So um, that list is enabled pretty much by the other list in the lower left, which is the fact that we can tune many of the system parameters. So in, uh, probably most notably uh, is the interaction strength, which is tunable by Feshbach resonances but also things like confinement, dimensionality, uh, lattice geometry, uh, lattice parameters, and so on are all easily controlled. Now, there's a little bit of a crack in that statement that I just said in that very nice picture, and that's that the temperature is not that uh, low in our systems relative to the Fermi temperature. And so this is something that in my group that we focused on, because if we're going to realize the most interesting of these strongly correlated phases, we have to be able to get to lower temperatures. And so this is something that we've, uh, that we've focused on and I'll talk about today. All right, so this is an outline of my talk. I'll first talk about uh, the Fermi-Hubbard model and uh, especially uh, Antiferromagnetism, which is predicted to occur uh, in the Fermi Hubbard model. And then I'll also talk about spin and balance Fermi gases, um, both in 1D and 3D, but also the crossover. Uh, most recently, we've looked at the crossover from one dimension to three dimensions, and I'll talk about those results as well. So, those, both those results pertain to the list on the previous page. Um, this is uh, the top, is uh, has to do with quantum magnetism, and the bottom, as I'll discuss, uh, is relevant to exotic superconductivity. All right, so first, the Fermi-Hubbard model. Um, this is what's motivating us. This is a, a generic phase diagram of a high-temperature superconductor. Um, this is temperature on the left axis and hole doping along the x-axis, or density for us. This is hole doping. Uh, in the electronic materials and density, where undoped means one atom, exactly one atom per site. And as you go away from that, you either reduce the density to the right or you increase the density to the left. So you can see some major regions of this phase diagram are antiferromagnetism, which occurs at temperatures below the Nael transition, which kind of typically in these materials is around room temperature. Um, and then also you see the D-wave uh, superconducting region where in a slightly doped uh, regime um, they see superconductivity and temperatures now we all know are in the region of 100 to 200 degrees uh, for some of the cuprate materials. 
Um, this is a very interesting regime here. This is the Sudagap regime, um, really still poorly understood. Um, it's maybe equally as intriguing as the D-wave superconductivity, um, but in this case, we really still don't yet understand what drives the pairing, what drives the pairing mechanism. So it's not phonon-induced like a traditional superconductor, but it has something to do with uh, quantum magnetism. Now this temperature looks like it should be reasonably high, uh, and it is in these electronic materials, as I said about room temperature, but really with the relevant temperature scale, not an absolute one, but really it's relative to the Fermi temperature. So the nail transition is occurring at a temperature which is about 3% of the Fermi temperature, uh, and for us that's a very, very low temperature. As we're giving up 10 orders of, of magnitude between the Fermi temperature of an electronic material at 10,000 Kelvin and the Fermi temperature of these ultra-cold gases, which is a micro Kelvin. So we have 10 orders of magnitude to give, and so we're really having to go to extraordinarily low temperatures into the nano Kelvin regime to be able to even realize this first goal of probing this phase diagram, which is to get into this region of, of magnetic correlations. So we're not going to study high temperature superconductivity, but rather, uh, well, indirectly we are, but uh, rather we're studying directly the Hubbard model. And this was proposed by Anderson in 1987 as a, as a minimal model of, of high temperature superconductivity. He claimed that this model was likely to contain the essence of D-wave uh, pairing. Um, we don't know that yet for sure, and that's one of the things that we're trying to understand uh, in the ultra-cold atom community and studying these systems. The Hamiltonian is very simple. It consists of a hopping term, which is governed by a parameter T, which uh, is, accounts for the kinetic energy of hopping from site to site. And if you land, if the atom lands on a site which is already occupied of the opposite spin, these are spin half fermions, they interact with some presumably repulsive interaction um, that is, raises the energy of these uh, state uh, relative to uh, the case of single occupation. The other thing I need to point out is this is a single band Hubbard model. So we're considering just uh, enough uh, energy states for two atoms. And so the population of each state can be either zero, one, or two. So it's one atom per site, we call that half filling, and two atoms per site is a band insulator where every uh, quantum state in the system is completely full. So this is a real paradigm model of strongly correlated matter. Its model was predicted, or was uh, written down many years ago in the 40s or 50s, having to do with uh, ex uh, explaining transition metal oxides um, something completely aside from superconductivity, uh, but it's, uh, the question is whether it contains high temperature superconductivity remains unanswered. And one of the reasons why it does is that this model, despite its inherent simplicity, is, cannot be solved numerically. And that's because the basis size is increasing exponentially with the size of the, of the system. And so while small systems at higher temperatures can be uh, solved numerically, with, notably uh, with quantum Monte Carlo, it's uh, the real exact solution uh, is never going to happen, uh, even with quantum Monte Carlo and the fastest digital computers. I should also uh, highlight this paper by Hofstetter, Serac, Zoller, Demler, and Lucan, which is a real hallmark uh, paper in this community. This is the paper that really laid out what needs to be done to use ultra-cold atoms to uh, model this system. All right, so there's a special case for the Hubbard model, which is the case of half-filling, where the Hubbard Hamiltonian becomes analogous to the, the Heisenberg antiferromagnet anti Hamiltonian. Um, J here is a super exchange coefficient, it goes like T squared over U, and uh, for low enough energy scales, uh, one goes into the, um, into the antiferromagnetic regime, 
but above that, if the interactions are strong enough compared to the temperature and the hopping, the system can go into an insulating phase, which is interaction driven. So this is really, this, this is a mod insulator. So the mod insulator, of course, is a much different kind of insulator than a band insulator because it involves the inter interactions to make, to make it happen. Um, this is, uh, was seen in these two papers, which are also landmark papers in the field. Uh, in, in Tillman Esslinger's group and Emmanuel Block's group uh, eight years ago, where they saw the reduction of double occupancies and the reduction of the compressibility of the system as it went into this mod insulating phase. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. So as I mentioned, if the temperature is sufficiently low below the Nael transition, which is governed by a super exchange interaction, then not only do you uh, obtain a mod insulator, but you obtain a mod insulator in which there's an alternating spin structure, something that looks like a checkerboard in some classical-like picture. This occurs when the entropy is less than log two. Entropy per particle is less than KB log two, or about 0.7 of KB. In that case, the spin degree of freedom starts to become uh, relevant to the entropy scale, and uh, going below that entropy can put you into this regime where magnetic correlations develop. So while in ultra-cold atom physics, while these uh, experiments saw the mod insulating phase, there's been no experiment yet achieved with an optical lattice that has seen antiferromagnetism below the nail transition. So this is uh, rather sobering to us in the field because we've now been working on it for a while and it really highlights, I think, the need to be able to get to even lower temperatures. This is very important for us to be able to continue into uh, probing not only antiferromagnetism, but other interesting, uh, strongly correlated phases of matter. All right, so this is a phase diagram that was, uh, that was done by our collaborators, uh, Teresa Paiva and others, uh, a few years ago. This is the temperature on this axis, scale the hopping. Interaction strength on this axis, also scale the hopping. In this region is antiferromagnetism. This is the Nael transition in the solid line. And the Nael transition, is a, you can see, uh, is a broad feature uh, in this phase diagram that is the convolution of, of two generic trends. One is the, uh, something which is exponential in T over U. Uh, this is what drives the mod insulator, and this is the super exchange interaction energy coming down uh, from higher energies to, to lower. So at low U, uh, its T nail is dominated by um, the, the exponential, whereas at high U, it's dominated by the super exchange energy. And so you can see that the entropies that one needs are even quite a bit below log two, which is up in here. Rather, it's something like 0.3 uh, KB per particle to be able to just cross over into the nail phase at the peak of this, uh, of this broad uh, feature. So this is uh, what we do in, in atomic physics. We're using uh, lithium-6 in our case, which is a composite Fermi gas to mimic the electrons in the lattice. Um, these are the two states that we use, which constitute a, a pseudo spin a half system. Our typical experimental parameters involve a few hundred thousand atoms that are uh, an even number in the, a, uh, or an unpolarized state in which there's the equal number of spin up and spin down atoms. Um, we have a lattice depth, which is typically around seven recoils. Um, in our case, the recoil temperature is about uh, a microkelvin. And just to give you a sense of scale, and for those who are experts in the audience, um, can see that the lattice parameters T is about a kilohertz, U, in this case, at 250 Bohr scattering length is about 10 times bigger than that, and uh, the super exchange energy scale then is about 25 nanokelvin, which is a couple of percent of the Fermi temperature. So that kind of sets the scale of the experiment, what we have to what we have to achieve. All right, so um, one of the issues that 
experiments have in a lattice is that there's no good way to cool in the lattice. So in traps, in three-dimensional traps, um, cooling always can occur by adjusting the depth of the trap such that the chemical potential sits very close to the threshold for evaporation. So in that case, atoms can be continuously evaporated and mitigates any kind of you know, technical sources of noise that you might have that are heating the gas up. And so in this way, it's very, uh, very typical to be able to achieve temperatures that are around 5% of the Fermi temperature, in which the entropy is, is relatively low, already uh, below or, or at least at uh, log 2 in that, in that scale. So whereas evaporative cooling works very well in a trap, it doesn't work at all in, in a lattice in the usual configuration. So this is a three-dimensional lattice in which these uh, big, broad, the broad envelopes constitute the uh, confinement envelopes of the lattice beams, and you can see the lattice on top of that. So the chemical potential sits deep down in the bottom of this lattice to uh, get to the density that we want of, of near half filling of one atom per site. And so the Boltzmann factor for evaporation is big. We don't have any evaporation, essentially. And so this is a, a very serious drawback to lattices as composed to a trap uh, because of this inability to do evaporative cooling. So we thought about that, and we realized that one can compensate this trapping potential by an anti-confining uh, potential. This is provided by a blue tuned laser beam, 532 nanometers in this case, which is not retroreflected. So whereas the lattice beams are retroreflected to form standing waves, these green uh, blue tuned beams are not. So this beam goes out and goes through a beam dump. That provides a potential which is smooth that can be, if the beam weights are the same size, can completely cancel uh, this confining envelope of the, of the lattice beam. And so you can end up with something looking a lot more like this, and you can adjust that. You now have a knob because you have the control of the intensity of this green beam, which can adjust the chemical potential to near the evaporation threshold, uh, in fact, uh, can uh, adjust it to anywhere around the evaporation threshold. So these are results after having done that. So um, we found that we could get colder temperatures in the lattice using this compensated uh, technique. And, um, and some of the results are shown here. So these are column density images. These are in situ images of the density profile, the column density profile uh, in the trap for three different interaction strengths. So U over T of three, 11, and uh, nearly 15 in blue. And when we do an Abel transform to go from the column densities to a real three-dimensional density, taking advantage of the cylindrical symmetry, one can see this very nice Mott Plateau. The, one of the reasons why it's so broad is that using this compensated lattice technique, you can also broaden the confining envelope. And so instead of being purely harmonic, if you adjust the size of the beams a little bit, you can make the confining potential to be, um, to be flatter, to be essentially uh, cordic, make the bands uh, essentially flatter. And so you can see the, the Mott Plateau in this region. These atoms are all in the Mott phase. And over here, this is the edge of that uh, Mott Plateau. Um, this is a, uh, a cal uh, numerical calculation showing the compressibility. Uh, the compressibility should vanish in an insulating phase. And you can see that as uh, the Mott insulator develops with increasing U. This is U over T of 2, 4, 8, and 16. And particularly for the very large interaction strengths at one atom per site at half filling, you can see how the compressibility vanishes, which is, insul which is indicating uh, uh, an insulating phase. And you also see that uh, for the band insulator at N equals 2. And it's particularly, these are all different temperatures, ranging from uh, T over hopping of 0.5 up to 2.4. And so the relevant temperature scale is somewhere around the hopping energy of around 1 
And you can see at those lower temperatures, T at one or below, begin to develop this um, incompressible um, feature at half filling. Um, this is our data, so we could extract the compressibility locally uh, in these in situ images. And uh, the data are shown, of course, in these black uh, points. And uh, calculations that were done by Asan Katami um, using numerical link cluster expansion are shown uh, either uh, in green for a temperature of 0.6, or red, this red line for a temperature of 1, or the hatch region corresponds to a temperature of 2.4. And uh, you can see that there's very little difference between the green uh, region and the red. Um, the difference between temperature of, of 0.6 and 1 is very essentially insignificant in the context of this compressibility. And so by the time you go below a temperature below T, below hopping, um, pretty much the mod insulator is formed. And uh, any further cooling uh, doesn't result in any other observable features in the density. So essentially what I'm saying is the density is frozen out when the temperature gets below this hopping energy scale. It doesn't say anything about the spin. It just says where the mod insulator is being formed. All right, so to detect magnetic order, um, we have to use some spin-sensitive technique. We use what they use in condensed matter, which is to um, detect uh, crystalline order using X-ray scattering or magnetic order using neutron scattering, which is spin-sensitive. We use a spin-sensitive uh, scattering of light, make it spin-sensitive by detuning in between the two spin states, and um, we... Um, send in the light at an angle that satisfies the Bragg criterion. So this is the input angle, this is the output beam in the coherently scattered direction. This is a, a lattice vector, which is in the 1, 1, 1 direction, or pi, pi, pi direction uh, in, in the context of, of neutron scattering or x-ray scattering. So um, this is just a body diagonal, um, which reflects the symmetry plane of the system. So this is what the system looks like. We have an input beam. We have our optical lattice here. We send in light at the, at the Bragg angle. We look at another Bragg angle, another angle that satisfies this Bragg condition. We put a camera there. And also for comparison, we put a camera at some arbitrary angle that is uh, not sensitive to the coherent scattering. And so it serves as a monitor that what we see is indeed a coherently scattered light. It turns out that the Bragg scattering, the intensity of the Bragg scattering, can be related to the spin structure factor by this uh, equation. And so by measuring that intensity, we can extract this quantity. And this quantity, the way I've normalized it, ranges from one to the number of particles in the system. Um, one means no correlations whatsoever and uh, just random. Uh, and N would be a perfectly correlated system. Uh, and so we can also normalize this in a very robust way by melting the lattice. We turn the lattice off at some time and, um, and then look in time of uh, expansion after a long time so there's no more crystalline order and we can normalize to that in a very robust way. So this is a calculation, a QMC calculation of the density dependence of the spin structure factor for temperatures ranging from 0.4 up to one. So this is the highest temperature, the next highest, and so on. And you can see that as you approach the nail transition, the spin structure factor is growing dramatically. Now the nail transition is about 0.37. So we're actually, this is the development of short range order, which is already reflected in the spin structure factor. So you don't have to go below the nail transition to be able to see this magnetic order. Um, but as you approach it, um, this peak is growing um, at a very rapid rate. All right, so this is the data. This is the spin structure factor on this axis versus interaction on this axis. These, this is the camera in the coherently scattered direction. This is the camera in the other direction in which there is no coherently scattered light. Um, and you can see it. there is this broad peak as predicted by the quantum Monte Carlo, and it's at about at the right place. 
Now, if we compare with the quantum Monte Carlo and the other numerical calculations um, for various temperatures, um, you can see how the peak is growing uh, as a function of this, uh, of, this, of this temperature as you decrease the temperature. This is 1.66, uh, 0.95, 0 0.71, and so on, until um, the lowest temperature here is 0.4, still ab above the nail transition, but just barely. So our data uh, clearly fits this dark green uh, calculation uh, very well. That's the calculation for a temperature of 0.5 uh, in units of hopping, which corresponds to about 40% above the nail transition. So what we're seeing is the development of short range order. We haven't gone below the nail transition, but we have been able to see the development of short range magnetic order um, that develops as you approach uh, the transition. So there's also some very nice uh, work in uh, Tillman Esslinger's group um, that was uh, uh, reported the nearest neighbor singlet correlations and a flurry of activity on the archive just in the last three months uh, with papers from Harvard, uh, MPQ, MIT, and Bond um, that appeared on the archive using uh, site-resolved imaging in a two-dimensional systems uh, to be able to detect uh, short-range correlations as well. So all of these experiments, including ours, are all now about at the same temperature. So we're somewhere just above the nail transition, very, very close to it. So how do we get colder? So one way is to look at this quantum Monte Carlo that I showed before as a guide. This is a homogeneous density. So if we look at an inhomogeneous density that you would get in a harmonic trap, the situation changes a little bit. Um, the uh, phase boundary and, and temperature looks more or less the same, but what's really important is if you look at the average density per particle, instead of being 0.3 per particle uh, in a trap, you can, get the point, you can get to the nail transition at 0.65, which is essentially log two. What's going on here is that the metallic wings of this distribution are able to store entropy. So unlike the mod insulator itself, which is not, the mod insulator is not able to store any additional entropy, the metallic wings are. And so this gives us a hint at a way that we might possibly realize lower temperatures in our system. The total entropy is conserved, obviously, in this closed system, um, but the entropy can be redistributed. And so what we uh, have been working on is an idea of using something we call entropy conduits, where we send in a laser beam, in this case a blue detuned beam, which expels some of the atoms from the Mott core. So imagine this is all a Mott core with one atom per site. Now if we put this beam in, it will push atoms out of that region. It'll essentially mimic the metallic uh, wings of the trap distribution, um, but in a very controlled way. And in fact, you can do this in uh, using DMDs or some other spatial light modulator to be able to put in these conduits in any kind of way that you would that you see fit, and uh, subject to a few laws of physics like diffraction, which is always an issue. So uh, this conduit is this beam produces a local reduction of density, and that's a good thing to redistribute and store entropy, but it also provides a, a conduit to transport entropy away from the center where it's insulating uh, into these conducting tubes to take them out to the wings where they can be evaporated by using this compensated optical lattice. So the, there are two good things that can occur uh, using this entropy conduit. And we're continuing to work on this and trying to find different schemes that we can use that don't change the overall density of the, of the mod insulator. So we use configurations involving blue and red uh, beams to be able to do that. So this is something that's work in progress. All right, now I'd like to switch gears here. I guess I have about 11 more minutes, so I, I think I can uh, get through the next topic without any issue. Uh, spin and balanced Fermi gases have been studied in the last 10 years or so in our community, 
uh, in 3D mainly, uh, but also in 1D and, um, and now in the crossover regime between 1D and 3D. So uh, what happens when you mismatch the Fermi energies of the two spin states? So this is the usual BCS-like system where we have an even number of spin up and spin down particles such that their Fermi energies are the same. And then we have pairing at the surface of the, of the Fermi sphere, uh, and the pairing can happen in uh, energy space over a width equal to the superconducting gap, delta. Now, if we add a few excess spin up atoms, then the Fermi energies are mismatched. This is the, say, the spin up atom Fermi energy and the spin down uh, Fermi energy. What happens then? And that's been the goal of, of the experiments that have been done to be able to understand um, this mismatch. And the mismatch can be created in a variety of ways. So, of course, in a cold atom system, we just make unequal spin populations. But in other systems, there are pairing of quarks and neutron stars uh, of different mass and also magnetized superconductors, in particular um, these uh, heavy electron superconductors, um, where this mismatch can be created by magnetic field. So way back in 1964, uh, these people predicted that you could have a form of superconductivity that had a mismatch in which the, the two spin states had mismatched Fermi surfaces. So imagine that in the BCS case where these are in momentum space, you have a spin up Fermi sphere, a spin down Fermi sphere. They pair at the surface of that Fermi sphere and they have uh, a net zero then center of mass momentum uh, for the pairs. Now in this FFLO situation where we have a mismatch in the Fermi surface, um, they don't touch unless they move relative to each other in momentum space. And that's equivalent to saying that the, um, the pairs can, be, uh, can accommodate this mismatch in the Fermi surfaces um, if the pairs have a center of mass momentum, which is non-zero, and in fact equal to the difference in the Fermi uh, momenta of the two spin states. So that can result in a very uh, intriguing uh, superconducting phase, one in which the order parameter is spatially modulated. Um, it breaks all kinds of symmetries, rotational symmetry and translational symmetry, of course, and uh, has remained uh, pretty much elusive um, in not only in condensed matter physics, but in cold atom physics as well. And so we're working on that, trying to find a smoking gun, which would be um, the center of mass momenta, which is non-zero uh, for the FFLO. So uh, we and others have studied phase separation um, in 3D, uh, and uh, four phases have been observed, a balanced superfluid, MIT group of Wolfgang Ketterle uh, found that, um, that this balanced superfluid supports uh, vortices and thereby proved that it was a superfluid. Um, outside of that is a uh, partially polarized normal phase or superconducting phase, depending on the interaction strength. And outside of that can be a fully polarized normal phase. And again, all of these existence of all of these phases depends where in the BEC-BCS crossover that one is, but uh, there are most of these four phases uh, that have been observed. So in 1D, we did an experiment in 1D a few years ago. In 1D, the phase separation is actually inverted relative to 3D. So in 3D, this balanced superfluid, equal populations of spin up and spin down, um, sit in the center, in the core. And in 1D, if there are a balanced superfluid phase, they sit in the wings. And that's completely different. And also, this partially polarized phase is predicted to be FFLO. So FFLO turns out to be essentially ubiquitous in one-dimensional systems, unlike three-dimensional systems. And so they're particularly intriguing in searches for um, one-dimensional, uh, or searches for FFLO physics. 
So this is a phase diagram that, that we published in 2015, and it's also been published by uh, MIT and, and ENS in their 3D experiments. Um, this is a, we transformed the phase diagram from mu to a radius and a trap, and this is polarization along this axis. Uh, the green here denotes the, the balanced superfluid. This is a partially polarized phase, and this is a fully polarized phase. So the phase separation is distinguished by the location of these phase boundaries. This is where the, the radius of the up spin goes to zero, radius of where the down spin goes to zero, the radius of the spin density uh, goes to zero, which is up minus down, and that can define then these uh, various phases. And where that goes to zero, beyond that is the Clarkson limit. Uh, beyond that, there is no uh, superfluidity which is allowed uh, because the, the uh, imbalance is bigger than the superconducting gap. So this is now in 1D. In the 1D system, we, we, uh, we create a one-dimensional system using a two-dimensional optical lattice. Um, this is the same phases as over here, but as I mentioned, inverted. So at zero radius, there's a partially polarized phase which is predicted to be this FFLO, but it's very sensitive to temperature in one dimension. This is the spin um, uh, balanced phase, the un unpolarized superfluid, and this is the fully polarized phase over here. So uh, clearly there's a big difference between these phase diagrams in 3D and 1D, but in this kind of a system, one can cross over by coupling the tubes together. So by adjusting lattice depth, um, these tubes are coupled, and one eventually should go from one-dimensional physics to, with the reduction of the lattice depth, uh, to uh, three-dimensional. So that's shown here. We can adjust this tunnel coupling between tubes by adjusting the lattice depth. And we can also adjust the interactions using uh, the Feshbach resonance and lithium-6. So uh, again, with small uh, coupling between tubes. One um, realizes the one-dimensional phase diagram I just showed. Um, this is where the tunneling is relatively small, uh, 0.013, um, and this is a function of central tube polarization. So we can tell it's a one-dimensional phase diagram because in the center, it's not a balanced superfluid, but rather unpolarized uh, phase, which is part of this, this orange region. Now, as you increase the tunnel coupling by making the lattice weaker, going from 12 recoils to 2.5 recoils, but also going into the BCS regime from the BEC regime, um, one sees that the phase diagram is actually completely changed. So now, in the center, you can see there's a very, very small superfluid core, unpolarized core, which is denoted, whose radius is denoted by um, or this polarization, it's uh, the critical polarization denoted by that circle. So this is the polarization of the, the central tube along this axis, and where that superfluid core vanishes corresponds to what we call uh, PC, or PC3D. So that's denoted here. So that is how we can distinguish that we've crossed over from one-dimensional system to a three-dimensional system. All right, so this is all of the data for uh, five different interaction strengths. Uh, this is unitarity at 832. This is the BEC regime at 780, and this is the BCS regime here. And as, let me remind you that 3 to, 3D means that the critical polarization is, gone, is not zero. And so what we have down here where it's zero, this is strictly the 1D regime, where the tunnel coupling is relatively small. Uh, as we go up in tunnel coupling, um, we go through the crossover regime where some of the interactions strength correspond to 1D and others correspond to, uh, to 1D and others correspond to 3D. As you go up further, uh, you've coupled all the tubes together and you're into the three-dimensional regime. So this is the crossover regime here. Depends both on the tunnel coupling, but also it depends on the interaction. The interaction dependence, you can kind of understand because in a one-dimensional system, the pairs are bound. 
And as you go further in the BEC regime, that binding energy gets, gets, gets greater, the deeper bound system, and the tunneling becomes more difficult. And so you can see for a BCS system, um, remains in the three, in the BCS uh, data, remains in the uh, 3D regime longer uh, than does the uh, data from the BEC side of resonance. So realizing that, we uh, decided to scale our data uh, in terms of the pair binding energy. And so instead of on this axis plotting just the, uh, the tunnel coupling, we plotted the normalized tunnel coupling, normalized to the pair binding energy. And here all of the data collapses. And there's a, a critical uh, collapse of, uh, of this scaled uh, tunneling of 0.016. And so this is, is I believe, to be universal, uh, depending, uh, not on depending on both on interactions and on tunneling strength. All right, so uh, let me uh, summarize um, my talk. We've talked about uh, quantum magnetism, antiferromagnetism in the Hubbard model. Uh, we've detected the uh, antiferromagnetic order um, using Bragg scattering of light. And uh, the thermometry, very accurate thermometry, could be obtained by comparing with quantum Monte Carlo. So we found that uh, the temperature was about 1.4 of the Nael transition. And I'd like to point out they were essentially at the limit of quantum Monte Carlo. They can't go any further because of the fermion sign problem um, in these calculations. And so away from half filling, um, the calculation pretty much peters out where we're at. So if we can get colder, we're going into the regime of physics where the theory uh, is no longer uh, in control and, and we as experimenters um, really have, will have to plant the flag. So uh, we also talked about ways of, of trying to get colder. This is what we're working on in my group now. Uh, we want to use entropy conduits to store entropy and also to conduct entropy away from the center into the edges where it can be evaporated. And then finally, I talked a little bit about uh, spin and balance Fermi gases, um, both in 3D and 1D, but also in this regime of crossing over from 1D to 3D. Now, um, I should point out, so I mentioned that FFLO is most robust in what, or is, is most pervasive, I should say, in one dimension. Uh, but in three dimensions, the, it's less susceptible to temperature fluctuations. And so um, it, it uh, is uh, therefore most likely that the most robust regime to look for FFLO order is in this crossover regime where uh, you still have the one dimensionality uh, the remnant of that and have FFLO physics uh, still be uh, present, um, but also have reduced uh, susceptibility to the uh, temperature fluctuations. Okay, so let me, uh, let me finish by acknowledging the people who did the work, uh, in particular uh, Ernie Young um, and uh, Pedro Duarte and uh, Russ Hart, who are not in this picture, um, did the uh, experiment on the quantum magnetism. Uh, Melissa Ravel and Jake Fry did the experiment on the 1D, 3D crossover in the spin and balance gases. So thanks very much. We have time for a few questions from the audience, if anybody would like to. Yes. Thank you, Randy, for your wonderful talk. Uh, my question is, uh, for uh, condensed matter physics, also uh, when the temperature uh, below the, uh, the near temperature, the way we change uh, the fast transition from the uh, <clears throat> normal uh, ferromagnetic field uh, fast to the antiferromagnetic uh, uh, fast. But uh, in your case, uh, when the temperature is, uh, reach the near temperature also maybe like uh, the fast tradition for antiferromagnetic happen. So my question is, uh, 
why use, uh, what's the difference between uh, optical radius, this kind of fast charging, uh, to the con condensed matter uh, fast? The, this is the first question. The second question is uh, why we call the, this kind of fast charging is a quantum matrix of fast charging. So this is the second okay. uh, question. Yeah. So the first, the answer to the first question is, is that they see exactly the same effect in condensed matter systems. Yeah, condensed matter, yeah. So, so they see the development of, of short range order above the NAL transition, um, but uh, their detection with neutron scattering is not as sensitive as ours. So that's one thing that we can do in our community with a little bit uh, better sensitivity with the light scattering, that we're able to see uh, the development of short range order with more precision, I would say, and at even higher temperatures than you can see in the condensed matter systems. But they see the same thing. So they see the development of short range order uh, also above the nail transition. Um, so so uh, one work that comes to mind is the work of Colin Broholm um, at Brown University uh, in, in, in the systems they've been looking at. So uh, the other question, quantum, quantum magnetism. Well, we're, de we're dealing with uh, strongly correlated systems where uh, single uh, particles are correlated to all the other particles in the system. And uh, this is very much a quantum mechanical system. So you the classical, for, for example, classical magnetism? Not, this is not mean field. So we cannot describe uh, the, the magnetic order in this system by a mean field. OK, thank you. Any other, any other questions uh, from the audience? Francesca. Hi. Hi, Randy. Uh, I have just a curiosity. So you, when you show your uh, temperature measurement of uh, 0 0.5 when uh, T over uh, the tunneling is 0 0.5 and you compare this measurement with the theory and then actually it fit with 0 0.5, I was yes. wondering, since you have this uh, nice control of your uh, green beam, can you change the temperature and see also the other below? Yes. Kind of all the other uh, yes, curve and, below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, that would be um, that, that would be a good thing to do. Um, we we can, and without the green beam at all, um, we don't see uh, any Bragg signal. And so the the green beam has to be um, tuned to um, optimally tuned to be able to see the Bragg signal at all. And so we definitely see strong variations in, in, the, in the Bragg signal depending on what the compensation is. And so we don't have, uh, if we reduce the size of the Bragg signal even further, it, it's really difficult to make very quantitative measurements. So I guess what I would, the way I would answer that to say is that um, uh, by not being optimally tuned, we don't see the Bragg. Um, and so that's not as a function of, the, of, of a temperature, but rather um, just a kind of binary um, yes-no check. Uh, one more, uh, Magic. Uh, in the antiferromagnetic uh, part, and uh, uh, when the uh, peak in the spin structure factor changes, how does the correlation and change in the union uh, of lattice? Okay, so uh, of course, as the uh, structure factor goes up, uh, the correlation length expands. And so for um, the value of the structure factor that we've measured, uh, the correlation length is something on the order of one to two sites. So it's, uh, you know, we're, we're talking very local correlations. Okay, uh, let's thank Randy for a wonderful thank talk. And next we'll move on to the second talk in the session uh, by uh, Francesca uh, Ferlino from uh, University of Innsbruck. And she will tell us about uh, dipolar Bose-Kahn